So uh, uh, we were. Uh, so f first of all, uh, let me explain uh, why uh, I care. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I came because of the following reason. Uh, before, two years before discovery of uh, the Higgs boson, Christoph Wetterich and myself, we wrote a paper predicting the Higgs mass. And we were predicting the Higgs mass uh, because we were insisting that uh, if uh, uh, gravity is asymptotically safe, and so let's assume that gravity is asymptotically safe, we were thinking that uh, the standard model should be asymptotically safe as well. And the standard model is, might be asymptotically safe if uh, the scalar uh, constant depends on the parameter mu in this way. So there is some point at which um, it equal to zero, and also its beta function is equal to zero. Okay, and on the level of this picture, we made a prediction that the Higgs mass should be 126 GV two years before, and it happened to be so, okay? And so that's why I, I don't like a negative value <laughs> of lambda. <laughs> okay, so I explained you why I care. Uh, so let me tell you some other references. So this analysis, this is a famous paper in which uh, the computation uh, of that was done. So we were also doing a similar computation. These people, they made this computation better than us. But then uh, two years after, there was yet another reference, 1507, 08833. Uh, which you can also consult. So this is a later paper where people claim that they've done even better job, okay? Uh, during these years, uh, yes, and indeed uh, uh, this work which uh, Graham mentioned, they say, okay, uh, at the level of three sigma, uh, this coupling constant is getting negative. So these people, they made an analysis, they said, no, 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 it's not three sigma, it's just 1.5 sigma. Okay. Also, what was happening during this time is uh, that uh, the mass of the top quark was getting down. Uh, not because it was getting down of <laughs> evolution of the universe, <laughs> but because of experimental data. <laughs> okay, so now it's uh, about uh, uh, 1 GeV or 0.8 GeV, smaller than it used to be, and that again uh, moves uh, the discrepancy uh, to a small amount of sigma. Just one comment on that. So the PG <laughs> 2008 claims the top core pole mass went down by 0.4 GeV relative to what 1307 did. So it did go down, but it was yeah. 0.4. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm talking about uh, CMS measurements, which uh, are not yet in PDG uh, book. Okay, so uh, there is thing uh, to talk about. There are uh, many theoretical challenges here, how to extract uh, really the top quark mass from LHC data, and there are very se serious people in QCD which are working on that. Okay, this is a very challenging and um, extremely interesting problem, which uh, and we are not there yet in a sense. There is some uncertainty. Okay, so I uh, played my uh, dirty trick, so I can <laughs> <laughs> I can remove. Uh, oh, I removed the number, but okay. I can give it to you if you are interested. And so let's uh, go, go back to uh, to Svalerons, uh, etc. So let me uh, write you uh, uh, some formula how we should uh, compute the rate of uh, uh, Svaleron transitions. Uh, in our uh, the theory, which is infinitely dimensional, in the sense that uh, we have a lot of coordinates and uh, uh, we have infinite number of degrees of freedom, as in uh, any field theory. Uh, remember, then, in quantum mechanical example, uh, the computation of the rate, it would be simple. Okay, so what uh, we should do? We should simply compute uh, the flux of particles which are moving in, in this direction. 
Okay, and then the flux of particles which are moving in this direction, that would give us the rate of transition from here to, he to here if we consider the highly excited states. Okay, so here uh, in the quantum mechanical example in one dimensional, uh, this point was easy. It was just corresponding to x equal to zero. Okay, now if you have field theory, then this is not a point anymore. This is an infinitely dimensional surface. So if you say that in field theory we have n degrees of freedom, uh, there is one degree of freedom which are, is associated with this negative mode, and everything else represents some surface which can be called separatrix, which uh, distinguish, uh, which separates uh, this minimum and that minimum. And so what, uh, in order to compute the rate, we have to compute the rate through this separatrix. Okay? So imagine that uh, this separatrix is um, uh, is defined by some function fq, and fq are all coordinates which we have in uh, our theory, and the equation for separatrix is fq equal to zero. So this replaces x, uh, x equal to zero in quantum mechanical example. And then. Uh, what you have, it's more or less uh, uh, obvious formula. We have here delta function fq, okay, which tells us uh, that we are only interested in coordinates which are staying on this separatrix. Uh, then we have df uh, dq times p, and p is infinite dimensional momentum in our theory. So we have infinite number of coordinates, we have infinite uh, number of momenta. And uh, what is uh, written here is the modular of the following quantity. So df over dq is a vector which is orthogonal to the separatrix. So this is a vector, vector which is exactly in the direction of negative mode. And then we multiply by this vector, this momentum, and so this gives us a projection of momentum on the negative mode. Okay, so this is exact analogy of that. So this term, and I take it modular, so we are only counting the uh, motion in one direction. Of course, in thermal equilibrium, there will be motion in both directions. They will compensate each other. And uh, here we have uh, uh, selected one direction only. <sighs> then we have... Yeah, I'm coming. This is a long formula. Uh, we have here exponential minus energy over temperature, which tells us what is the probability to have configuration with this or that energy. And then we integrate over all momenta and over all coordinates. So this is path integral. And then uh, we divide all that by a normalization factor, which is uh, exponential minus beta h dp dq. Okay, so this is a path integral which uh, we should compute in order to find the rate of Fulleron transitions. And uh, when you compute uh, this integral, uh, you should remember that this is a uh, complicated theory. This is a gauge theory. So uh, your computation should respect uh, gauge invariance. And therefore, you have to do gauge fixing. You have to introduce ghosts if necessary. Uh, you should remember that this is also field theory. And in field theory, there are divergences. And this divergence should be eliminated. So you have to introduce counter terms. Uh, uh, th there is yet another uh, point uh, which is essential here and which uh, should be taken into account. Uh, uh, and this is existence of uh, uh, zero modes. So what uh, zero modes mean here? We constructed our uh, Svalerone solution, but we can move it. Okay? It could be in point X, it could be displaced in point uh, Y, etc. And this means that formally this integral is divergent. And 
there is a specific procedure which deals with zero modes, which I'm not going to describe, but it's a normal procedure if you're dealing with instantons and other uh, uh, solutions like that. So what you do, you introduce some collective coordinate, and then this integration over collective coordinates is traded over integration of the volume. Okay. Uh, Okay, and if you take uh, one uh, plus one dimensional theory, which uh, I uh, discuss, you can do this computation. You can find some prefactor, which would be associated with determinant of small fluctuations around uh, Sphaleron solution, and you will get uh, this uh, factor the thermodynamical factor exponential uh, minus E sphaleron over temperature, uh, which gives us uh, the Boltzmann suppression of the rate. Okay. Uh, moreover, uh, you can uh, do uh, you can test all hypotheses on a computer. Okay. What you can say that okay, I have this uh, field theory. Uh, I'm going to solve equations of motion on a computer. I will create first uh, the, con the configuration with the weight given by this Boltzmann exponent, and then I will just follow uh, its evolution in time. And so this uh, experiment, uh, numerical, were done a long time ago, and they confirm uh, this picture. Okay, so what do you get in this uh, uh, experiment? Suppose this is real part of phi, and here is uh, imaginary part of phi. And this is uh, this uh, circle, degenerate circle, which uh, uh, was associated with this bottom when I was uh, uh, playing uh, with watches. Okay, and so then uh, the uh, you can first take conf configuration, which uh, uh, is like that. Okay, so the point. On, uh, on this complicated curve is associated with the uh, position on the spatial circle. And then you see uh, that this thing somehow involved in time, and then you see that at some particular time it will look something like that, and then at some other time it will uh, look like that. And so that will uh, be exactly the Sphaleron transition. And uh, this uh, uh, little uh, part here is Sphaleron plus uh, fluctuations around it. Okay. So you can observe uh, these processes in time. You can uh, extract uh, the rate of fluctuations from your numerical simulations, and it perfectly fits this formula. Okay. So there are no doubts whatsoever that uh, this is all uh, true. Okay, so uh, at this uh, point I stop uh, discussing uh, one plus one dimensional theory and will tell you what happens in the standard model. So, yes. Uh, when uh, the, the, the Sphaleron process happens, you know that the Chern-Simons number changes? Yeah, the Chern-Simons yeah. number uh, <laughs> changes. Yeah. So when you go from this configuration to that configuration, the Chern-Simons number changes by one. So that here, uh, integral a1 dx is equal to 0 uh, to pi over e and uh, here you find that uh, uh, no e over 2 pi and in final configuration e over 2 pi integral a1 dx will be equal to 1 and during this time evolution, you can also uh, compute e over 2 pi integral f uh, minu epsilon uh, minu. And uh, you will see that in this case, uh, it's oscillate near 0. And here, it's oscillate near 1. Yeah. OK, so you, you will see the picture like that. Here is t. Here is uh, integral. Uh, yeah, uh, I put, so there are oscillations here, then there is transition and oscillation uh, at this point. Uh, my uh, exact question is that when uh, the fermion number changes, is there any back reaction to the uh, effective potential of our gauge fields? Yeah, this is a very good question, and I will come to that when I will start discussing the, the universe. Okay. 
Okay, so electrolytic theory. Now. Sorry? Is this happening in vacuum? No, no, no. No, you, you need to have uh, non zero temperature. Okay. Uh, so, this uh, real time evolution which I was discussing, it doesn't catch us any quantum effect. So, it doesn't catch uh, the quantum mechanical tunneling. So, it's literally like that. You have classical field theory, you have a configuration with certain energy. Uh, the configurations are distributed according to the Boltzmann factor. You create this configuration, it has some energy, and then you evolve it in time, just solving classical equations of motion. And that's what uh, you're going to observe. Okay. Can it happen at zero temperature? Sorry? Can it happen at zero temperature? It can happen at zero temperature, but then you need a completely different approach to see that uh, numerically. Okay. Then this is tunneling, or you have to do, uh, or you have to go to uh, Euclidean space and do that, or you have to do uh, quantum mechanics in real time. We need to start with some gauge field. Yes, right? yes, so yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. But can I ask about that plot? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, isn't that integral or the thing you are plotting an integer, an integer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is zero. This is one. But can <coughs> it, it cannot be 1.1, say, you know? Yeah, yeah, it can. Of course it can. So isn't that integral quantized? No. Oh. It uh, quantized only if uh, the initial and final configuration are related to each other by large gauge transformation. If uh, this is not so, this is then it's not quantized. And this integral can take whatever value. And it, it's really oscillate. So wha what is here? Uh, what is plotted here, this axis is an integral from 0 to t, f dual d to x. No. So this integral is quantized when you consider tunneling transitions. Okay, if you consider vacuum, vacuum transitions in uh, Euclidean space-time. Okay, your initial configuration has zero energy, your final configuration has zero energy. Compute this integral, you get integer number. But not um, uh, ah, because in real it's time. The x dt, right? Yeah. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's the x dt. Uh, does the transition from one uh, chance number to the other uh, depend on the amplitude of the gauge field? Uh, the amplitude of the gauge field is fixed by equations of motion. Mm -hmm. uh, in a sense that uh, uh, y y y y you, uh, this is not in your hands. Okay. You created some configuration, then the system evolves as it wants to evolve. You just observe it. And yes, uh, uh, you can see that at this point where there is transition. OK, you look at this uh, thing. You follow uh, f of dual, f dual as a function of time. OK, you say, aha, here I get a jump. Let me look at the uh, configuration of the scalar field. And then you see that it is indeed uh, uh, close to a Sphaleron configuration. So in one plus one dimension, these are relatively straightforward uh, uh, simulations. They were done many, many years ago. And now people can do that uh, much, much uh, better, not only in one dimensional theory, but uh, in uh, the standard model. And they were doing that. OK, so I finished uh, with, uh, uh, <coughs> with U1 theory. And now we come to the standard model, SU2 cross U1. OK? So if uh, uh, you take the standard model, uh, then you write Lagrangian. And then you find out that uh, uh, in the Lagrangian of the standard model, without high dimensional operators, which uh, Graham discussed, the standard model conserves uh, four numbers. This is Le, L mu, L tau, and baryon number. <coughs> okay. And this is analog to the fermion number, which we had in 1 plus 1 dimensions. Uh, you can look at uh, vacuum structure in the standard model. So normally you say, OK, in the standard model, our phi field is equal to that, and our A field is equal to 0. OK. 
So in the discussion which follows, I will ignore u1 factor, which happens to be irrelevant. And this is exactly the analog of uh, the vacuum states which uh, we had in uh, one plus one dimensional theory. <coughs> but there are other analogs here. We can write that phi is equal to omega zero v and a i field. Okay, let me remove uh, this index here, and then a i. It is tau a. A, I, A, and tau A are SU2 matrices, so this is a matrix notation. And A, I is equal to omega D, I, <coughs> omega minus 1. Okay, and so what omega is? Omega is just a gauge transformation. Now, <coughs> in uh, 1 plus 1 dimensional theory, we had uh, two types of gauge transformations. So one were gauge transformations which were continuous, and other, there were uh, gauge transformations, which are called large gauge transformations, which were making a mapping between uh, our circle and uh, the group U1. Okay, group U1 is compact group. Uh, it's also a circle, so it was mapping of circle to the circle. So here, uh, what we have, we can also compactify our space. So imagine that our space is not infinite, but it's a uh, sphere S3. Okay, then the uh, SU2 group uh, topologically is also a sphere S3, and therefore uh, this function A, omega, which I put here, can be non-trivial. So it makes a non-trivial mapping of a three-dimensional sphere, which is our space, to a three-dimensional sphere, which is the group. Okay. Complete analogy. Uh, so here, uh, in one plus one dimensional theory, we were writing integer number, uh, which was associated with this mapping, which uh, was equal to integral a1 uh, dx. So here, we can also write a similar type of topological number, which will be integral d3x uh, trace ai aj ak times epsilon ijk. Okay, and A are exactly these matrices. And one can also show that this is an in integer uh, valued quantity. Oops, I went down uh, in this line, okay. Uh, so we also have uh, uh, the similar topological structure, but now it's associated with mapping of S3 into uh, S3. Analogy uh, doesn't finish here. We can look at uh, the level crossing exactly in the way uh, we were uh, doing in one plus one dimensional theory. So what uh, uh, we can do, we can ask uh, the following question. If uh, this is our parameter tau and this are the fermion energy, we construct AI, which interpolates between AI is equal to zero and AI equal to omega d omega minus one, so that omega corresponds to non-trivial mapping of one sphere to another sphere. And what we're gonna see, we're gonna see the similar picture that the, uh, will be uh, level crossing and one of the levels will cross zero. So what kind of equation you will have to solve for that? You will have to solve the Dirac equation d uh, psi is uh, equal to zero. Okay. Complete analogy. Yet another thing which is uh, extremely close to that is anomaly equation. You can say, okay, uh, we define here the fermionic current which is psi left, gamma mu psi left. Okay, psi is some left-handed doublet. Uh, in in uh, naively, we would think that this current is conserved, but uh, when we make a proper regularization and compute a triangular graph, we find out that this is not true, 
and the divergence of this current is not equal to zero, but in fact is proportional to uh, f of dou. So, d mu g mu fermionic is okay, g square of 16 pi square f of dou. F dual is equal to epsilon mini rho sigma, F rho sigma one half. And this is uh, the, the definition, okay? And this happens because uh, uh, left-handed and right-handed particles interact with SU two fields in a different way. Uh, Jimmy, it's uh, psi bar L. Psi L minus uh, psi R or so? No, no, no. Here uh, I'm just taking, uh, 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 I will, uh, R field, it's not coupled to SU2, okay? So uh, if you take uh, R field only, then uh, this cannot happen, okay? There can be some contribution coming from U1, but uh, from SO2 there is nothing. So here, no, no, I'm literally uh, right in left-handed fields. Okay, so we have uh, uh, everything the same. The difference, very important difference, uh, is uh, the following. So in the standard model, we have uh, uh, many generations, right? We have three generations. And we have uh, not only three generations, out of uh, this uh, uh, three generations, we can construct uh, nine left-handed quark currents. Why nine? Three generations, three colors. And three left-handed leptonic currents. Okay? So why I'm writing that? We can write in total 9 plus 3, 12 equations of Dirac type. The, all these equations look absolutely similar to each other. Therefore, the level crossing will occur for every of these 12 equations. And therefore, this process in the standard model is going to create 12 fermions, nine quarks and three leptons. And therefore, the uh, selection rule for this process will be delta B is equal to delta L equal to three. So why I'm saying delta B is equal to three? Because every quark by definition, has baryon number equal to one third. Okay. So, the baryon number, the conclusion is, baryon number is not conserved in electroweak theory, and it has uh, this type of uh, selection rules. So, proton is absolutely stable, and the lowest process which uh, you can imagine to happen is the process like this. So, for instance, you have proton plus neutrino. Oh, sorry. Uh, I will write it. This is detron, and this can go, for instance, to antiproton, electron, uh, muon. Yeah, I want to keep. Uh, okay, you can figure out. Y you put here. Let me put here a uh, question mark, and you can figure out what kind of charge I should put here, whether I should uh, take neutrino or electron to have electric charge uh, conservation. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the process which may occur in this model. <coughs> now, uh, since I have to overpass the barrier, then these processes are exponentially suppressed. You can do uh, the computation, and uh, you find out that uh, the uh, probability to have uh, 
this type of uh, uh, transition as proportional to exponential minus 4 pi over alpha w. And so this is extremely small number. Uh, so you are guaranteed to have uh, uh, stability of matter at uh, normal conditions. OK? So we take that. Uh, we can search for a sphaleron. So th the problem uh, computationally is uh, uh, somewhat uh, more uh, complicated than in 1 plus 1 dimensional theory, where we essentially had just, uh, just a scalar field. So here it's not true. But again, you can take uh, the uh, Lagrangian of the standard model get from this Lagrangian equations of motion, look for uh, static solutions. And you find the sphaleron. Okay. So the uh, uh, sphaleron in this theory is a spherical symmetric configuration. And it has uh, uh, the following form. Uh, so A is equal to vacuum expectation value. F xi over xi r times sigma. I will write and then I will explain what the notations are. And phi field is equal to V over square root of 2 H xi r sigma times phi zero. So the, the notations are uh, the following. Phi zero is zero one. R hat is r divided, divided by modulo r. And this parameter xi is dimensionless parameter, which is g times v times r. So it's basically mass of uh, w or z times r. Okay, And then uh, these uh, functions, they obey uh, different boundary conditions. And uh, these conditions are So f0 uh, is equal to h0 equal to 0. And this uh, point is, again, very much similar to 1 plus 1 dimensional example which we had. Remember that the scalar field configuration was equal to 0 at 0. And here it's again scalar field configuration is equal to 0 at 0. And then uh, f uh, infinity is equal to h infinity as is equal to 1. So that uh, at large, at large distances, uh, we have uh, uh, phi, which coincides with its vacuum expectation value up to direction in isotopical uh, space. OK, so uh, this solution was found in the camera of Mountain quite a while ago. So you can uh, find the uh, energy of uh, the solution. And the result is that mass of sphaleron, or energy of sphaleron, uh, whatever name uh, we take, is equal to 2 mw over alpha w. And here we have some function of uh, the ratio of mass of uh, the Higgs field to the mass of uh, W. And this is roughly uh, 10 keV. Okay, so that's an interesting scale uh, in electroweak theory. Now you can take the solution and compute uh, the uh, sphaleron rate. And you find that the sphaleron rate is equal to some prefactor. Uh, 
uh, times exponential minus mass of uh, Sveleron divided by temperature. And so from here, uh, you conclude that if uh, the temperature is sufficiently large, then this rate is not uh, suppressed. And so we get this uh, uh, very interesting picture. Standard model has barren number non conservation. In the early universe, this barren number non conservation is fast. In our condition, it's so slow. OK, and that's exactly what uh, we need for uh, barogenesis. OK, so this computation here is more involved than in one plus one dimensional case. Because again, we have gauge symmetry, uh, ghosts uh, count to terms, divergences in 3 plus 1 are more severe than in 1 plus 1. And so you have to do uh, quite some work in order to, uh, to see what happens. So okay. Maybe this question is strange, but can the LHC running at 10 TV produce a vacuum transition? I, I would say no. Okay. Uh, the reason is uh, the following. Uh, remember that um, uh, this Valeron uh, has one negative mode. Okay. So in order to have this transition, you should be able to concentrate all the energy which you have at hand in this particular direction, which corresponds to uh, this mode. But you have infinite number of directions. OK? Mm -hmm. And so when you have LHC collision, you will excite all this infinite number of uh, uh, directions, but not uh, this one. OK? And what I said is kind of qualitative picture, but uh, this qualitative picture can be uh, put into paper, into equations, and people spend quite some time uh, trying to figure out what is happening. And their conclusion was that no. Though, uh, if you look at the literature, you find out that there are some people who say that the answer is yes, and I don't think that their claim is uh, substantiated, <laughs> really. Okay, yes? Um, uh, concerning uh, the anomaly equation uh, in this case, yes. um, which part, I mean, um, since this is a quite complex group, I mean, I, I, I think uh, I, we can separate that in axial and vector part in the yeah, yeah, yeah. way as it done with SU3. Yes, so yes, uh, okay. Uh, in, in yeah, I, I'll, uh, that's a very good question, and I will give you the, the answer. So as I said, uh, the standard model, it has, uh, if you don't take into uh, anomaly into account, then we have uh, four conservation laws. So one is lepton number of each generation and uh, B. So we can uh, organize uh, four uh, different currents and uh, quite a number of different anomaly equations. Okay? So if you work uh, through uh, coefficients, you will find out that the numbers Li minus one third B are conserved. Okay, so if you make this combination, compute triangular anomaly, you will find out that uh, f of dual term uh, completely disappears. And if you organize the current which corresponds to B plus L, you will find out that it is this current which is touched by anomaly. And this belongs to, I mean, it's linked to which part of the group uh, of this? Uh, the group uh, SU2. So like SU2 axial, I don't know, something like that. Oh, uh, well, first of all, uh, this is a billion thing. So oh, it's just U1. one. So it's a U1. Uh, so it's uh, U1. So mm -hmm. it's uh, uh, what you do, you have Q left, uh, gamma mu q left plus uh, q right gamma mu q right. And then you sum up uh, all the quarks. That gives you a barrier number. And then uh, you add uh, the same uh, thing. 
uh, where you replace uh, quarks by uh, leptons and, and you include left-handed and right-handed counterparts. So it's literally like this. Total baryon number plus uh, total lepton number in the standard model has uh, uh, this anomaly. Okay? Sorry. Yes? Uh, this number, if I remember, this, uh, this was the barrier of the weakest failure processes and uh, uh, I, I think that it is computed in the zero temperature. Yeah, no, uh, this, yeah, yeah, th that's a very good question. So I will repeat the question and then give an answer because I, anyway, I wanted to give uh, this answer. Uh, so if uh, uh, you look at this uh, formula, uh, then we have here 10 TeV and indeed uh, the mass of uh, this phaleron was computed neglecting all temperature effects. And uh, once we are at uh, non-zero temperatures, then we have to redo a computation and account for the fact, for instance, that uh, the vacuum expectation value of the scalar field changes when uh, we change the temperature. Okay, I, I will come to, uh, to this point later, but the message is that uh, if uh, this is temperature and this is vacuum expectation for the scalar field, then it has uh, this type of uh, behavior and there is some point which uh, uh, is critical point, but in fact it's not a critical point, I will talk to that about that later, uh, at which uh, the wave of uh, the scalar field, so to say, vanish. Okay, so this happens at temperature around 160 GV. Okay, and so at temperatures about higher than 160 GV, there is no barrier whatsoever and the system can go from one type of vacuum to another uh, type of vacuum without any uh, suppression. Okay. And uh, here I, I would like again to, to make a comment. I'm not uh, going to explain you uh, many things, just uh, uh, will make uh, the just make the statement. So there were uh, really many, many work and uh, uh, many uh, labor included in estimation of all of these phaleron rates, phaleron mass, etc., etc. Uh, there were many contributions by Guy Moore, who was uh, lecturing uh, last uh, week or uh, yeah, first week, and uh, we can we now know this phaleron rate at all temperatures with great precision. Okay. So we know that uh, at uh, temperatures greater than 160 GeV, we can, so we are, so to say, in symmetric phase of electroweak theory. The rate doesn't contain any exponential suppression, simply because um, the mass of uh, W is kind of small, and this rate is equal to 18 plus minus 3 alpha w to the fifth power temperature to the fourth. And this is a rate of this transition per unit time and unit volume. And uh, these numbers uh, were derived after some huge work. Part of this work was analytic to figure out how to compute uh, this rate on the computer and part of this uh, work is numerical when you do uh, quite massive uh, lattice simulations. Yes? Uh, arrow bar, you always ha have arrow bar once you, you are doing lattice. Okay, so lattice li like doing experiment. Okay, and the, the, the source of this arrow bars, there were lectures on lattice field theory. There are many sources. First, uh, there are uh, just statistical errors like in Monte Carlo. Okay, because you cannot span all possible configuration, you just pick up uh, part of them. And then uh, there are different errors associated with extrapolation. Okay, you cannot uh, do your theory in infinite volume, you have to do it in final volume, so uh, you have, uh, and then at the end of the game, you have to extrapolate to large volume that induces errors. You cannot do your simulation at uh, zero uh, lattice spacing, 
and there are errors, errors associated with that. You do exploit correlation with that, so there are all this uh, uh, machinery of lattice simulations which uh, enters into uh, into these errors. Yeah, dimension it's uh, uh, rate unit time unit volume. Okay, so the dimensionality is GV to the fourth. So the answer, uh, this rate uh, answers to the following question. You uh, pick up uh, some part of your plasma with the volume V and you count uh, Sphaleron transitions in positive direction and negative direction, all of them. And uh, how many of these transitions occurs uh, here, okay. So in order to find the number of transitions, you multiply by time and you multiply by the volume of uh, of the box. Uh, so this is at this temperature and at temperature less uh, than 160 GeV, uh, you find that uh, logarithm of gamma over T to the fourth is equal to 0.83 plus minus 0.01 TGV minus 147.7 plus minus 1.9. And uh, this was a work of Kari Rumukainen and collaborators. And so this question is over. In the sense that uh, we have the standard model, we know what the mass of the Higgs is, so we can put the Higgs mass, then we do this uh, lattice simulations and uh, we get this failure on rate. Does it coincide with the ana analytical expression? In uh, the domain where they should overlap, they coincide with each other. Okay. Uh, so after uh, all uh, this uh, theory uh, issues, we can finally come back to cosmology. Yeah, uh, this has a spalion rate, but what about the uh, scattering cross-section for the variant violation? Uh, it's uh, the same. Yeah. Once you have a uh, spalion transition, you have level crossing, and uh, that's it. You have fermion number and conservation. But that's a very good question, and I I'll come to it. Okay. okay? Uh, in just one or two minutes. So this is the rate of uh, fluctuations which change uh, topological number and change of topological number leads to level fermionic level crossing and to creation of destruction of fermions. Okay. And, and can I also ask this yes. something? So in, in, in order to calculate this rate, do, to, do you also have to take into account that in order to go from one vacuum to, to the other that there would also be the possibility that you go like so from n, so if you want to go from, uh, say, the winding number n zero to n one, you could also go to n two and three, and then come back to n one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you also have taken into Yeah, yeah, this is taken into account. Okay, I, I can tell you perhaps a few words how uh, how numerics go to to determine this rate. Uh, so you imagine this picture. Uh, this is uh, Chern Simon's number, and this is energy. And you have this type of uh, uh, periodic potential. Okay? And so you're following evolution of Chern Simon's number. And a very good uh, uh, general physics analogy is the following Imagine that uh, you have a big particle, basically a Brownian particle, which is uh, in some media. Okay? So if you take a Brownian particle, you know that uh, different molecules will uh, uh, collide with it, and then uh, this particle will make a Brownian motion, okay? so which Einstein and other people uh, discussed. And you know that uh, the position of uh, this particle, uh, in average, will be equal to zero if you start from here, because it can go to the left, to the right, uh, whatever direction. But uh, if you consider x square t, then will grow linearly with time, right? So it's important. So here is the same. You put your system here, and then it evolves in time, 
and then uh, the chain Simon's number square will be uh, proportional to time. And this coefficient of proportionality is uh, exactly this rate uh, we are interested in. Okay. So what is done in uh, uh, these numerical experiments is that you take your system, you evolve it in time, you do that many, many, many times, you take this average and you extract uh, this rate. Okay? And uh, it's true that it goes here, it goes back, it fluctuates, it's the same thing as Brownian motion, but uh, what is involved here is the, the suppression of this uh, uh, probability of going from here to here by uh, this uh, barrier heat. Okay. Okay, now, uh, we are back to cosmology, and since we are back to uh, cosmology, uh, we want to know when these processes are in thermal equilibrium. Okay. And so for this uh, end, uh, uh, what we should do, we should compare the rate of these processes with the rate of universe expansion. Okay. To get uh, the rate of these processes, I should take T cube out of here, because this is per unit volume. Then we will get uh, the number which has dimensionality of the rate. We compare it with the rate of universe expansion, and we find out that uh, if temperature is greater than 130 GeV, we are in equilibrium. Okay? So, if we are above 160 GeV, we are certainly in equilibrium because uh, there is no suppression, there is just some alpha suppression and the thermal equilibrium is, uh, is very, very good. Uh, when the temperature decreases, we are getting this uh, exponential suppression of the rate and at some temperature, uh, this suppression of the rate starts to compete uh, with the rate of universe expansion. So this happens at 130 GeV. And so this is a number for the standard model. So this is again the number which is known very well within 1% uh, accuracy. Okay, so if uh, we talk about baryogenesis, uh, we should be thinking about this temperature. Right, because above we are in thermal equilibrium, and below we are completely out of equilibrium, we can neglect uh, this, uh, this transition, so it should be something uh, around uh, this point. So be before uh, discussing different uh, prospects for, uh, for baryogenesis, I will uh, talk about... Uh, can I ask yes. Uh, so if I'm at very high temperature, I can think that my state is uh, somehow in several vacuums, no? So mm -hmm. when it will uh, cool down, mm -hmm. some parts will be in, in one vacuum, and other parts of the system will be in the other vacuum. And maybe when the system goes to reach the same vacuum for everyone, there we are, is when I produce the variation or something like yeah. that. Yeah, uh, you can work out uh, this hypothesis, and you will see that if there is no CP violation involved, uh, then you will get extremely small number, because uh, uh, part of that will be in so to say positive, another part will be in negative. So the average thing it will be a fluctuation. You can compute what this fluctuation could be. This very small number, much much less than ten to the minus ten. Okay. Okay. So uh, the very first uh, question, which um, I will discuss uh, now, is uh, uh, the following. And uh, well, that's an important question because uh, it gives also uh, a important uh, physical picture of uh, uh, what is happening. So up to now, I was uh, uh, considering uh, fermions as kind of spectators 
for this process. So I was telling, okay, this uh, uh, gauge fields and scalar fields, they have their own evolution and the fermions just follow. So it's clear that this is kind of uh, approximation, which is not uh, necessar necessarily true. So let's uh, uh, see what uh, will be happening in reality. If we neglect uh, fermions, then we have uh, this picture. This is NCS, and uh, this is the energy. So we have this uh, periodic structure. There are some barriers, etc., etc. And uh, when we go from this point to that point, and if there are no fermions, then nothing happens. Okay, the system here and here, they are uh, uh, absolutely equivalent. If we have fermions, this is not true any longer. Because if we go from here to here, we create fermions. Go from here to here, we create fermions, create fermions, and this costs energy. So if we add uh, fermions to our system, the picture will be somewhat different. It will be like this. Okay? So if you start from a system when there is no fermion number, we're going to stay here. Because, okay, there will be fluctuations in this direction, but this, the system wants to react back because you are gaining energy moving in this direction or in that direction. Okay, so system likes to be in a state with uh, zero b plus l, l number. Okay, I'm talking about b plus l because other numbers are all conserved. Okay. So what does it mean? Imagine that uh, you have a uh, uh, Initially, in your system, non-zero, B plus L. Okay? This means that we are somewhere here. And so you see what is going to happen if we are here. The probability of going up will be smaller then the probability going down, right? Because uh, here we have to uh, overcome the barrier which is higher than this barrier here. So if we have a uh, non-zero fermion number, the system will be biased and it will be moving in the direction so that it, was, it wants to uh, reduce uh, this fermion number. Sorry? What is so special with B plus L equals zero? Why is the minimum times in B plus L equals zero? Uh, B plus L uh, uh, is the only uh, fermion number which is touched by these processes. Uh, all others are not touched at all. But why is zero? Uh, why uh, uh, is zero? Why is zero is the minimum? Ah, why zero is the minimum is is very simple reason. Uh, if um, you have uh, uh, equal number, uh, this is a question of uh, uh, equilibrium thermodynamics. Take uh, the system which uh, contains some fermion number. Okay. If the system contains some fermion number, it means that uh, there is some chemical potential uh, for fermions associated with this number. Okay, and fermionic density is and F are equal to energy plus minus mu divided by T plus one. Okay, now you take uh, this distribution function, you compute energy of your system and you try to figure out what is the best chemical potential it should have so it, that it has uh, minimum uh, free energy. Okay, you find mu equal to zero. And mu equal to zero corresponds to B plus L equal to zero. Once you introduce a symmetry, that costs energy. No symmetry, uh, there is no cost. Okay, so it's indeed the, uh, B plus L equal to zero, uh, which minimizes uh, this configuration. Okay? Uh, 
so you can uh, make uh, this uh, uh, discussion also uh, quantitative and you can write the uh, kinetic equation which uh, Yes. Does it make sense to even talk about when these fermions are being created, uh, they're being created relativistically or not, or like whether they impact entropy of the universe or not? Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah, it, it makes like sense. Uh, uh, so the, the question was, well, if uh, the number is not conserved, can we talk uh, at all about these things? Yes, uh, we can. For if we consider the system, at uh, the time, which is uh, small compared uh, with the rate of uh, this reaction, yes, uh, we have a total right to talk about these things. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, mm, yeah, that, that, that's uh, really uh, uh, your question is very general, and it's uh, there's not not only this point, but any process in kinetic theory. Okay, so once you have kinetic theory, uh, th there could be different processes there. Some of these processes take short time, some of these processes take longer time, and depending uh, what you ask yourself, you take into account this process, you, you don't take into account others, etc. Okay, and this is all uh, uh, coming uh, from Kinetic theory. I don't know how uh, much uh, guy was discussing kinetic theory. So, like when the when the spalerons are going through the barrier, the fermions are produced relativistically. Is that is that? Is oh, that's a good question, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Even if they're not produced uh, relativistically, they will immediately collide with other particles, which uh, will make them uh, relativistic. But uh, again, uh, uh, there are several processes the fermions are participating. So there are processes in which uh, they just collide with each other. Okay, and uh, these are uh, the processes well, of this type. Okay, the probability of this process is alpha square. So this process is much faster than the Fullerton transitions. So that uh, if I taking care about the time scale which is larger than uh, the time scale associated with that, I can say that this process is in thermal equilibrium and account for uh, spherons only, etc., etc. So there is this uh, hierarchy of different relaxation time which uh, uh, can be taken into account and which simplifies uh, life enormously in all these uh, kinetic discussions. Yes. The rate that you mentioned was uh, computed in this uh, effective potential. And as yes. you mentioned, this is the correct one. Yes. I want to see what's the rate of space. Yeah, that's what I was about to write. Okay. So the uh, uh, thing which you can do is uh, uh, the following. Uh, once you have uh, the system with non-zero value of B plus L, since all other processes can be considered to be in thermal equilibrium, a good description of this excess would be chemical potential for this number. Okay? Uh, you know how the chemical potential appears in the Boltzmann exponent. So we have Hamiltonian over T, and then uh, there are uh, corrections like mu divided by temperature. Okay. If you go in this direction, then this probability will contain uh, E minus mu over T. And if you go in that direction, this probability will contain E plus mu over T. Because in this case, you are clumping in energy. In this case, you are going down in energy. And then the difference of probabilities going up and going down will be a difference between these two numbers, minus here. And if uh, chemical potential is small, then it will be just proportional to mu over temperature. OK, so that gives us the difference in probabilities. And that allows us to write immediately, or almost immediately, the uh, kinetic equation for the chemical potential. So mu dot is equal to gamma sphaleron times mu 
it should be one over t cube uh, from consideration of dimension. And then here uh, there is some number which accounts for kinetic theory, which uh, I decided not to discuss because it uh, w will take too much time and uh, I will not come to the points which I really want to, to talk about. Okay. So here uh, there is some uh, number which is of the order of one. So just a coefficient which accounts for different processes, which accounts for the fact that Higgs may or may not have vacuum expectation value, uh, etc., etc. Okay, and of course uh, there is an error here. Yeah, uh, so Harvey, <laughs> you figure out that before. I wanted to ask this question <laughs> of the students. <laughs> okay, <laughs> your answer. <to> <laughs> So there was an error here, there is a minus sign. So the system uh, relaxed uh, to uh, mu equal to zero, okay? And uh, so what uh, uh, this equation is telling us, it's telling us the, form, uh, the following. So suppose uh, that there is uh, some uh, new physics at high energy scale. I'm writing here 130 GV because uh, this is the temperature at which uh, our uh, uh, swellerons decouple. And suppose that this uh, physics leads to different asymmetries. The asymmetry in baryon number, asymmetry in lepton number. So this happens in this old uh, Sakharov model. This also happens in different grand unified theories. And then le legitimate question to ask is what will be the fate of, uh, uh, of this asymmetry. So if uh, initially the physics was such that we got uh, B plus L not equal to zero, then this further on processes will erase that completely. Okay, so if you want something to stay, you have to create asymmetries in the numbers which are exactly conserved. This is Li minus one third b. So if you grant unified theory or whatever uh, mechanism uh, which you uh, can invent, if uh, you create this, and this is of the order of 10 to the minus 10, then this is immune to Swellerone processes. If you just take a theory which can create B plus L, that's it. It doesn't work. Because everything uh, will be uh, destroyed and everything uh, will be eaten up uh, by, uh, by spherons. But some people they say that B minus L is preserved by Sphalerons, no? B minus L? Yeah, uh, uh, there are actually three numbers. Yeah, and B minus L is also uh, preserved by the, uh, by the Sphalerons. Okay, so if you create B minus L, that's fine. But even if you create not B minus L, but some of these guys, then you can still uh, uh, get some baryon asymmetry at the end. Okay. So is that number zero? Zero? Which one? Now L minus B. Uh, B, uh, B plus L? B minus L. Uh, that's a good question. This is a billion uh, dollar question. <laughs> uh, it's a billion dollar question because of the following reason. Uh, uh, we know what the baryon asymmetry of the universe is. Okay, so we have a can handle on that. We can compute uh, the number of, um, uh, of baryons. Uh, whether we have uh, a symmetry in lepton number is a very complicated question. Why? Because uh, we do know what is a symmetry in electrons. We can count electrons. But uh, in order to see whether we have L asymmetry or not, 
we should be able to measure uh, neutrino, uh, relic neutrinos. And we are far from being there. Mm -hmm. It's an extremely challenging thing because neutrinos uh, interact very, very strongly. And then there is yet another obstacle uh, here, which, so if neutrinos are indeed Majorana particles, you don't know uh, what is the lepton number of there, you know the chirality and this chirality is uh, evolution of this uh, chirality. Uh, I mean, the universe evolved so long time so that everything is mixed up. Mm, so, uh, uh, Sorry, could you say, so initially you have plus L unequal zero, scholar around the raised symmetry, and what is with the new physics at high temperatures? I didn't yeah, my statement was that uh, imagine that you have uh, uh, some high energy physics, okay, and this high energy physics operates at temperatures higher than solar on the ground, and suppose that it produces uh, B plus L only, nothing else. Mm -hmm. Then uh, this doesn't work because B plus L will be erased by solar on transitions. Yes, but that's what you want, no? No. I want to get some barrier on the symmetry. Yes, okay. <laughs> no, I, I want to have some asymmetry, okay? And if I had uh, just uh, B plus L, then B plus L will go to zero, and from here I can com com compute barrier number as well, it will be equal to zero as well. Okay, and that will be a really minimum of, uh, of free energy in which uh, B is equal to zero, L is equal to zero, uh, everything is equal to zero. So my statement was that uh, you need to have uh, a symmetry in these numbers to uh, get better on a symmetry. If you are thinking about uh, a very high uh, uh, energy source of, uh, of, pr of producing a better on a symmetry. Okay. Okay, now uh, let's come to the following point, which uh, is uh, very essential and which actually uh, produces a solid, at least to my taste, motivation for existence of new physics. Okay, so that will be a supplement to, uh, to Graham lecture uh, today. So we can uh, address the following question. Okay, great. We have uh, uh, the standard model. Uh, there is a uh, baryon number uh, non-conservation there. We have uh, CP violation there, experimentally. And we have universe expansion. So we have everything at our hands. Okay, so let's, let's try to make baryon asymmetry out of that. And uh, this doesn't work. Okay, and there are uh, several arguments why uh, this doesn't work. Uh, the first argument, it comes from the structure of CP violation. Okay. Uh, so the interesting uh, temperature range for us is around 130 GeV. Okay, why so? Because above the system is in very well in thermal equilibrium, no baryon asymmetry can be produced. Below, the rate of Solaron transitions is exponentially suppressed. Baryon number is effectively conserved. Okay, so we should uh, consider the temperature of uh, the order of uh, 130 GeV. And now, uh, once we take this temperature, we can estimate uh, CP violating effects in the standard model. So how do we do that? Uh, we take the temperature of 130 GeV, and we observe that at these temperatures, the quark masses are small. 
uh, with the exception of mass of the top quark, uh, but we will see that uh, this is not that important. Okay. Note that in the standard model, uh, the CP violation only sits in Yukawa couplings. So it sits in, uh, in uh, the <coughs> Kobayashi Maskawa sector. Let you, me remind you uh, how Kobayashi Maskawa sector uh, looks like. So you left have a left handed uh, doublet. Then you have Kobayashi Maskawa matrix. Here you have a matri uh, mass matrix for D quark. And here you have uh, DR. Okay, and so this is 3 by 3 matrix. MD is diagonal matrix. And then we have yet another term, which is Q left bar MU times U. Right. Okay. And MD is diagonal matrix, is MB, MS, uh, MD. Here we have zero. And here we have mass of uh, U, which is mass of top, mass of uh, charm, and mass of up, zero, zero. Okay? So we compute Baron asymmetry. We don't know what the process uh, is important, but uh, what we are sure about, we have this temperature. Uh, the masses are smaller than the temperature, and therefore these factors here can be considered as a perturbation. So we can expand with respect to uh, these masses. Now, we expand with respect to these masses, and uh, we are uh, Compute the total baryon number. Okay, so the uh, flavor should be an essential. So we have to sum up all the fla flavors. And therefore, uh, on mathematical sense, we have to compute uh, the traces of different matrices. And so how uh, this can be uh, visualized? Uh, so the trace will be a circle, and then on this circle, I am putting uh, different dots, which correspond to insertion of uh, these quantities. Okay. If I go from one dot to another, then uh, I can uh, put here lib uh, or upright or d right so for instance d right here okay ah uh, and therefore the computation is dealing with the blocks like this so what these blocks are in this language if i'm dealing with mu like here I'm getting mu square, where mu is diagonal matrix. If I'm dealing with d, that will give me k m d square k dica. Because here uh, there is one line which enters, enters, so we have k and k dica. Okay, so we have the matrix like this, which I will call mu, and we have the matrix like that which I call MD. And so the final answer should be proportional to the product, arbitrary product of these matrices, and taking trace out of them. So the answer uh, should be uh, something like that, uh, mu to some power m, md to some power n, mu to some power m2, md to some power 
uh, and two, etc. Okay. Now, uh, this type of trace should contain an information about CP violating phase. If it doesn't, this means that this combination is CP uh, even. And in our processes, there should be CP break. Because we know that if we don't have CP, we should get zero. OK? And now uh, you ask yourself what kind of uh, uh, trace it should be so that it keeps uh, uh, CP violating phase. And what you discover is that the uh, first trace in which you have that, in which you have imaginary part, it has the form mu to the cube, md square, mu, md. OK, just to give you uh, uh, the hint w uh, why it's so. Uh, so trivial example. Trace uh, mu doesn't work, right? Because it's uh, real uh, stuff. Trace md doesn't work, OK? Because md is this guy. You take the trace. K is uh, you use the cyclic property of trace. K is disappear. You don't care. And then uh, you do just a uh, stupid work. You are writing here uh, whatever you can, and you find out that this is the minimal uh, thing in which uh, CP violation appears. Okay, and then you count the power: three plus two, five, six, seven. Each contains square of your cover coupling, so it's fourteen order n. You cover couplings. Okay. Then you say, okay, uh, this is dimensional full quantity. We should divide it by some uh, stuff uh, with dimension. This is uh, our temperature. We divide one uh, by the two, uh, the first number by another number, and then you estimate for. Uh, CP violating effect is just uh, this guy divided by this temperature to the uh, 14 uh, power. You put the numbers and you get 10 to the minus 20. And we need 10 to the minus 10. Okay, and we even didn't discuss what the mechanism could be. Maybe uh, we didn't discuss departure from thermal equilibrium. We didn't discuss anything whatsoever. Uh, we get very very small number. Sorry. No, no. Uh, that's an exercise uh, for you to do. Uh, try uh, lower order. You will find that imaginary part of all uh, smaller amount of traces is uh, equal to zero. Uh, there is some subtlety here. You can put here two instead of three, but this doesn't change anything because uh, uh, the m mass of top quark uh, dominates uh, and there is some consolation when you have two here. So, uh, so it doesn't work. And uh, there is uh, uh, one more uh, point, which I think, ah, uh, uh, by the way, uh, there was a paper uh, recently where it was said that in, spa in spite of uh, uh, this suppression, you can still get uh, baron asymmetry in the standard model. So it's 1906, uh, 04, 084. So homework to find a loophole in this paper. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Okay, there is uh, uh, yet another point which uh, uh, makes uh, discussion of. Uh, so, y okay, uh, we're gonna kill the dead horse once more. <laughs> so, remember, yes. Yes, Igor. This paper is claiming that uh, you can make a baron asymmetry of the universe in the standard model, uh, in spite of the fact that uh, this type of estimates give you 10 to the minus 20. So this paper suggests uh, uh, that, in fact, uh, this scale t0 should be suppressed by, s uh, should be actually smaller than that. And uh, then they argue that you can still get 10 to the minus 10. But uh, I'm not convinced by the arguments. But uh, I don't want to tell you why, because this is an exercise for the students. OK, so uh, uh, one more thing, and, and then I will, uh, I will finish for today. Uh, We need to have uh, departures from thermal equilibrium, right, in order to uh, get uh, uh, baron asymmetry of the universe. And uh, if we look at uh, temperatures of the order of uh, 130 GeV, uh, then uh, you can look at different reactions. So uh, elementary particles in the standard model, they participate in many reactions, electromagnetic reactions, strong reactions, uh, weak reactions, etc. So if you look, uh, for instance, at strong reactions, QQ bar going to uh, gluons, then you find that the rate of these reactions is of the order of uh, uh, 10 to the plus uh, 14. OK, so these reactions are much, much faster than the rate of universe expansion. So these reactions are in thermal equilibrium. If you look at uh, electromagnetic reactions, it's also like that. Gamma over H is 10 to the 12. Even if you look at uh, reactions, which are the slowest in this system, which are associated with uh, right electron uh, Yukawa coupling, and Graham mentioned that that's a small number, 10 to the minus 6, you still find that gamma over H for this reaction is 10 plus 2. So our system is literally very, very close to thermal equilibrium. And we can ask ourselves, uh, what happens? Okay. Can we overcome uh, another Sakharov requirement? So we failed to overcome uh, CP violation, and now we ask ourselves, can we get uh, large deviations from thermal uh, non-equilibrium? And so looking here, the answer would be no, we cannot. We are in thermal equilibrium very well. But in principle, uh, the following is possible. We can say that if very, very high temperatures, electroweak symmetry is restored, and at uh, uh, very small temperatures, electroweak symmetry is broken. And we are in going from symmetric phase to the uh, broken phase. Okay? And uh, actually, the phase structure of electroweak uh, theory happens to be not like this. It happens to be like uh, the phase structure and vapor gas uh, system, which uh, Igor was discussing this moment, uh, this morning. So, if you put here temperature and put here the mass of the Higgs boson, then uh, the phase diagram looks like this. Above this line, we are so to say, in symmetric phase. And below this line, we are, so to say, in the Higgs phase. And this line has an end. Okay? And actually, this uh, end corresponds to a critical point. And actually, we even know that this critical point corresponds to uh, Eisenach model. So it's like lambda phi uh, to the fourth uh, uh, theory 
uh, at this point, okay? So, if the universe uh, evolves in this way, there are no drastic uh, events whatsoever. The universe is cooled down, and there are no phase transition, no deviations from thermal equilibrium. If uh, the universe were happened to be like this, then it's going to cross uh, this line, and then we get a first order phase transition. Okay? And phase, uh, first order phase transition is a potential source for thermal non-equilibrium. Okay? You know very well first order phase transition, the water boils, you get these bubbles, they expand. So you can potentially get uh, deviation from thermal equilibrium. So the crucial question is where we are. And uh, uh, for this, we need to know the position of this uh, uh, critical point. And again, this is a standard model. We can analyze everything there. There were a lot of work on this uh, phase diagram, which established convincingly uh, that uh, the mass which corresponds to this uh, point is 73 GV. Okay. Higgs is more heavier than 73 GV, and so the universe evolves uh, without touching any phase transition line. There are no deviations from thermal equilibrium. Barogenesis is impossible. Okay, so we arrived to conclusion that we do need new physics. Okay, we don't know what this new physics could be, but uh, the standard model fails uh, to explain uh, baryon asymmetry of the universe. So it fails to explain our existence, galaxies, stuff like that. And so we have to think. Uh, what kind of theory can uh, save uh, the situation, and that's I will be uh, talking about tomorrow. Uh, the question was, what about PMNS matrix? Uh, this question will be answered tomorrow morning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a long answer, so... Yeah. This question of the phase diagram was studied in, in great detail. So, were, were people not aware of this argument of the lack of uh, enough CP violation when this study was done, or or is there a way around this uh, this argument with the ten to the minus twenty? Yes. So, so oh, oh. There were none. I mean, there was nonetheless the motivation to study the space diagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to, to study. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. So th the question was, uh, why bother if uh, uh, we have uh, uh, this type of thing? Uh, okay. So this is about uh, history. It happened that uh, 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 the person. Yeah, uh, who discussed this uh, barrier and asymmetry in the standard model? It was actually me. So this is uh, this argument is due to me long long time ago. Okay, but uh, uh, so I found this number ten to the minus uh, uh, twenty. It was back in uh, eighty six or say eighty seven, so quite a while ago. And uh, so I, I, I myself I was trying to be uh, very conservative and thought, okay, maybe uh, we can, one can invent uh, some mechanism which overcomes this uh, uh, number. Okay? So I invented some mechanism, and then uh, this mechanism was dynamical, uh, related to some unknown structure at that time of gauge theories at uh, high temperatures. And then uh, uh, we did, uh, together with Jan Ambjorn, some lattice simulations, checking this mechanism, and we found that it doesn't work. Okay. Uh, and so uh, this was uh, buried. Then, uh, in spite of this uh, number, uh, it's 10 to the minus 20, uh, Glenus Farrar and myself, we came out uh, with yet another uh, mechanism for baryogenesis, which uh, was done on assumption 
that uh, there is phase transition at that time. So that again was a long time ago, in 90 something, and at that time we didn't know what uh, the mass of the Higgs boson is. Okay? And we invented some uh, mechanism which uh, uh, perhaps could have uh, driven this number to a larger uh, values. Okay, so our mechanism was challenged by other people, uh, by Bell and Gavella and collaborators, but at that time we didn't believe that uh, they were right, we believed that uh, we were right, okay? And uh, since we were not convinced, we studied this question whether there is a uh, uh, phase transition or not. And we indeed put a lot of efforts in that, doing lattice simulations, and uh, we found uh, this number 72 uh, GeV, and more or less at the same time, lab number went higher this value, <laughs> so <laughs> it didn't work <laughs> at all. So the reason why it was done, it's also related to, to really this uh, different experiments which, uh, which were done, in particular at CERN. So we thought that, okay, maybe, suppose that there is some mechanism, we are missing this mechanism. Okay, but if there is no phase transition, then uh, there is no point in, in discussing that. Yes. Is the process of going departure from thermal equilibrium in that paper is also questionable, or is that just a CP? Uh, well, you should read the paper. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Very nice. So, temperature is lower than one hundred and thirty G B. Mm -hmm. In that estimate, uh, should we put uh, T or B or the X bar in the estimate for the system reaction? Uh, downstairs? Yeah. No, no, we should put. Um, yeah, that's a very good question, okay? Uh, it's uh, the question uh, about the strength of CP violation in the standard model, okay? So if we take the standard model, after all, we know that uh, there is a lot of CP violation in the standard model. So if you take uh, CP violation in uh, uh, KK bar oscillations, then the number is 10 to the minus uh, 3. Okay. Uh, why is this difference? So this difference is exactly associated with the fact that here we integrate over uh, the flavor effects. So if we are at energies, like the mass of K, uh, then, uh, uh, and uh, we are talking about CPU violation not in baryon number, but in some particular channel, then all these computations break down, okay, and you have to uh, redo uh, everything. And then, indeed, you find that, say, in CPU violation, the uh, correct uh, uh, measure of uh, that is uh, just related with the products of uh, CKM uh, matrix elements and uh, the phase which is of the order of 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4. Okay, so if uh, there were relevant processes, really relevant for that, which are associated not with this number 130 GeV, but uh, with number of the order of 1 GeV, perhaps it would work. Uh, the uh, presence of a magnetic field because... Uh, ah, this can change. Okay. Yeah, if uh, there are magnetic okay. fields in the universe with uh, sufficiently uh, strength, uh, sufficiently strong, and this changes this picture. Okay, uh, I have a question to you because I expected this question uh, from audience, but uh, I get nothing. <laughs> uh, do you understand this picture? Okay, we say that at high temperature symmetry is restored at low temperature, symmetry is broken. How could it be that there is a, an end point in this phase transition line? So the picture which uh, uh, at least quite a number of people have in mind is that if we take very high temperatures, the wave of the Higgs field is equal to zero, masses of W and Z are equal to zero. When we enter 
into the broken phase, the f of the Higgs field is non-equal to zero, and masses of W and Z are also non-equal to zero. How co could it be that, that there is nothing? The symmetry is breaking. When symmetry is broken, you should have uh, phase transition. You know the answer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, can I? Yes. Try it? Yes. One more. <laughs> 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 Can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> you weren't listening, but okay. Um, in here, um, we have a potential uh, which is something that looks like this. Um, but, um, and um, but when you uh, come closer to here, uh, you'll have a potential uh, which uh, has a cubic term. Uh, and when you cross this line, uh, you'll uh, the, the non-symmetric vacuum will, be, will have lower potential energy than this. And um, now the system uh, has to overcome this barrier. And so there will be a first order phase transition. But uh, here, um, uh, this potential uh, won't have this sort of a uh, third order term. So it will just go from this to this. And then, then the system sits uh, through this. And this um, web can smoothly vary uh, from 0 to non-zero value. Am I close of being correct? Uh, half. OK. <laughs> so the, uh, your explanation would be still uh, OK if uh, here uh, there is yet another line uh, which would uh, correspond to second order phase transition, which you are describing uh, here. OK. But in fact, there is nothing. OK, so the trick is, and uh, well, that's an important point, uh, is that uh, if you take uh, gauge uh, theory with the scalar field, in particular here with the scale SU2 with the scalar field in fundamental representation, okay, in this uh, type of theory, the gauge symmetry is never broken. OK, so ga gauge symmetry is never broken. So the words that uh, gauge symmetry is broken are uh, abuse of the language. Gauge symmetry is always exact. And in order to look at uh, the phase structure, you have to use gauge invariant order parameters. And if you take SU2 plus Higgs doublet, there is no any gauge invariant order parameter which can distinguish between the broken and uh, the Higgs phase. And so this is just one phase. Okay? And this explains why the phase diagram may have this form. There is no Higgs phase and symmetric phase. There is just one phase. Okay? And they can be continuously uh, connected. And the reason for that because there is no gauge symmetry breaking. There is no gauge invariant or the parameter which um, can distinguish these two phases. In U1 theory, this is not the case. In U1 theory, you have uh, uh, this type of phase diagram. Because there, there is another parameter which, uh, which can distinguish Higgs phase and symmetric phase. And this other parameter is the photon mass. That's a non-local parameter. And there, indeed, uh, the phase structure of this symmetry has this form. You have a uh, first order transition line, then a critical point, and then a line of continuous phase transition. Okay. And gauge theories, which are non-abelian, are not like that. And that was uh, suggested a long, long time ago, but uh, by uh, Fratkin and, uh, and Schenker. Yeah.
it goes back to 70s, if not 60s. Well, what is the Higgs wave? Is that a gauge invariant? Uh, Higgs wave is not gauge invariant, but uh, this type of operator is gauge invariant. But this type of operator is not equal to zero, both is symmetric and in the Higgs phases. Sorry? Is that it's non zero everywhere? Or or yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's non zero everywhere. Yeah. And it does not evolve with temperature? Or yeah, it does evolve with temperature, but it, it evolves. Uh, so, this operator, there are uh, se several subtleties associated with this operator because this is a product of two fields in the same point. So, you have to subtract divergences, etc. But uh, uh, this guy it evolves in this way. If uh, this is temperature, this is phi di the phi. Uh, then it goes down and then it goes up again. So there is uh, some point here which uh, uh, corresponds to a smooth crossover between these two phases. But no, I it never goes to zero. And so the statement that W and Z masses at high temperatures are zero, it's wrong. Okay. So they're actually not zero. This non abelian theory, and they give, uh, they get some non perturbative corrections associated with confinement in three dimensional theory. So the CNFP is always spontaneously No, the symmetry is always intact. <laughs> Gauge symmetry never broken. Oh, yeah. So this guy doesn't break any symmetry. So this uh, plot, as you mentioned, is for SU2 plus Higgs, then the... Yeah, SU2 plus Higgs. Well, you can add U1. It doesn't change much. Doesn't change. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that's right. What about the first order line? Yeah, first order line, uh, it may or may not exist. I mean, and we know the example which uh, Igor discussed uh, this morning. You take uh, vapor liquid phase transition. It can be a first order phase transition, but uh, you can go between uh, these phases in uh, different ways uh, so continuously. If you had a mass of the Higgs less than 73. Yeah, then we would get a phase transition. That will be a. What would be the order parameter in that case? Uh, here, uh, you will get a jump of phi dega phi. So when you uh, cross uh, this line, you will see an abrupt change of phi dega phi. But you will also see that uh, other characteristics of the phase transition, such as latent heat, uh, whatever, um, free energy continues, but derivative of free energy won't be equal to zero with respect to temperature that gives you latent heat. Yeah. All this stuff. Yes, sir. So you missed uh, in U1 the first order uh, phase transition line transforms. Yeah, in, in, uh, in uh, U1 the, uh, the, the situation is different. Uh, and it's different because of the following reason. In uh, U1 uh, there is uh, uh, photon. Okay, and photon corresponds to Abelian symmetry. And uh, you can indeed check in all orders of perturbation theory and also doing non perturbative analysis that uh, the photon mass, mass of this excitation, is zero in one phase and non zero in another phase. Uh, to put it in, in uh, the language of solid state physics, uh, the magnetic fields are not screened in the normal phase of superconductor and screen the Meissner effect in the superconducting phase. Okay, and here uh, there is uh, something which you can't point out. This is equal to zero in one phase and not equal to zero in another phase. In non-abelian theories, it, it's not like that. Yeah, yeah, they're still massive. They are getting uh, mass uh, of the order of uh, g square uh, times temperature. This is just the thermal mass. It's not the thermal mass. The thermal, uh, it's a mass which comes really from non-abelian character of that. Well, you can say this is thermal mass. Uh, the, the thermal masses uh, are of the order of g times t. 
uh, perhaps uh, Guy was uh, talking about that. This is associated with device screening and uh, plasmon frequencies, etc. So this is, there is some non-perturbative contribution to the mass, which is g squared times t, which is one power g more uh, than that. And this contribution, it is just there, it cannot be uh, removed. So the result of the mass, which is g squared? The by mass is gt. Yeah. So this mass, if I don't know again if a guy was talking about that, uh, if you take gauge theories at high temperatures, they they suffer from infrared catastrophe, okay? Which uh, Andre Linde first pointed out, and uh, this is exactly associated with the scale g squared t, and uh, the physics of that is also related to the structure of phase diagram of this form. Okay. okay.